And by the end of it, by the time it gets back to the speaker, it's just this, this tattered rose that nobody wants. If you've ever been harmed or hurt by the way the church has talked about sex, waiting for marriage, purity, then this video is for you. And I pray it's a healing video for you. You see, in a lot of ways, I grew up in the thick of purity culture. Homeschooled, conservative Christian, um, all the trademarks of somebody that would be connected to purity culture and have it ingrained within them. Now, I have to say my parents are awesome. In a lot of ways, they push back on a lot of the purity culture mentality and, and the harmful things that were a part of that movement. But at the same time, it was impossible for me not to be influenced by a lot of the folks around me and also just culture in general that I resonated with, the homeschooled conservative Christian culture that propagated a lot of these ideas of purity culture. Now, if you're not as familiar with purity culture and what that actually looks like, then this might be startling for you. This might be like, you might not believe me when, with some of the things that I'm going to say that we believed or that we internalized. It's going to seem too far-fetched, maybe too crazy for you, uh, but I want to assure you that this is a lot of what we were taught and a lot of what our culture and pastors and speakers were propagating and promoting at the time. Now, rightfully so, we've learned from it. Rightfully so, we've pushed back and and, and kind of entered a more, what I believe is to be a more biblical space. Um, but meanwhile, many people have uh, left Christianity that have been harmed and hurt by this, that have just rejected it wholesale because they believe that Jesus has rejected them which isn't the case. So let me just give you a little bit of an overview of what purity culture is in a lot of ways. So I want you to imagine for a second that you are at a youth conference, okay? A youth conference this is often where it happened, some sort of youth group, something like that. And the speaker is, um, you know, talking about sexuality and, and purity and how God values our purity and that he wants us to walk in holiness in this area of sexuality. And maybe she mentions or he mentions pornography or mentions, um, you know, just not looking with lust. And generally it's, it's directed at the boys too, but also the girls. For the girls, it's about modesty and making sure that you're not making the boys stumble by what you're wearing. And so this is a lot of the, the messaging, and I'm not saying all this is bad, but this is just what you come to expect. And then all of a sudden, um, he lifts up a piece of paper, okay? And then he passes this piece of paper to the person in the front row, and he says, okay, I want you to pass this piece, piece of paper along, you know, along the way, and um, everyone, you know, hold it, everyone touch it, uh, make sure you have a firm grasp on it, and then pass it to the next person. And what happens after it goes through maybe 100 people, maybe if you're at a big youth conference, it goes through, you know, 1,000 people, you know, youth, they're just kind of grabbing it, they're passing along, maybe they're trying to be careful with it, some are, but are, others are just kind of crumpling it up, and it gets back to the pastor or the speaker at the front. And he says, he looks at this and he says, well, this is you when you've been used sexually. This is you when you've been with a lot of people sexually. You've, you've been crumpled up. You've been tattered. You've been torn. You see how there's these, these rips in here. They, they can't be repaired. And these creases in there, these can't be straightened. And you don't want to be like this piece of paper. And that's why God wants you to be pure. So you won't be like this. And you think, and you're maybe 14 years old, you're 13 years old, you're sitting in this audience and maybe you've had, you know, maybe you've had your first kiss, maybe you haven't, and maybe you've dated somebody, maybe, you know, you haven't, or you're thinking about these things as sexuality is just confusing for you. But now it's ingrained in your mind that this is something that, that is just like, you know, irreversible. It's irreversible. It is the ultimate, the deadliest sin of them all is to um, not save yourself towards for marriage. And, and it's just, this is just how it is. And there's this deep shame and fear that's already building within you. It's not a desire to follow God. It's not a desire, oh, I want to do this for God because I love God. It's this desire to not be that crumpled piece of paper, to not be worthless, to not be used, to not be nothing. To, to somebody. And so you just kind of press on and think of this, another one, you're in the youth camp and he pulls out another illustration. He pulls out this piece of tape and he passes it to you and he says, okay, everyone stick this piece of tape on them. Okay. Everyone sticks this piece of tape on them. And, 
and they're, you know, everyone's going through and it gets back to the pa- the pastor and he says, well, look how not sticky this is. This isn't sticky anymore. This is you when you've been with a lot of people, when you're not sticky anymore, you're not able to bond with them because you bonded with so many people. And so once again, this message of fear, this message of shame, and you just imagine this person that is in the audience that has been with few people and the deep shame that they'd experience is not the love, the transcendent love of God that brings about redemption and healing and forgiveness and restoration and newness. It's this God of judgment, which is an aspect of who God is, right? We, we are judged for our sin, but it stops there. It's a God that looks at you with disdain and disgust, but offers no, you no redemption and no mercy. And this is a guy that many people cannot handle being around. And that's why they leave. That's why they feel so dejected and, and, and pushed away by the church. And one more. This is the most popular, the rose. Now, you know, um, I have to be honest and say this isn't the newest rose, but um, what the pastor would usually get, a fresh rose. And they pass it around and say, okay, everyone, you know, Take maybe take a petal off this rose and and kind of just pass it around a little bit and and so it's going to all the all the youth and they're taking off a petal here and a, and a petal there and maybe some of them are getting a little bit too excited about it and taking off a few more and and by the end of it by the time it gets back to the speaker it's just this this tattered rose that nobody wants. At least that's what he says. I just remember this impactful, one of the most impactful sermons that I've ever watched was by Matt Chandler. And he talks about the rose and he talks about how he brought this um, young mom um, to, uh, you know, this, that he had been in, in her, his Bible study and to this conference. And this pastor did just this. And he says, who would want this rose? And I just remember Matt Chandler screaming by the, with the top of his lungs, at the top of his lungs saying, Jesus wants the rose. Jesus wants the rose. And that's the truth for all of us. You see, it's not that we are all spotless or blameless, but that through Christ we can may, be made just that. It's that these harmful purity culture analogies are a further representation of the lack of grace and redemption that was spoken of in those days. It was a complete focus on fear and shame and guilt in order to manipulate behavior as opposed to a focus on having our hearts and our minds drawn towards Christ despite what we've done in our past because we see the sinfulness of our ways and we're drawn to the Savior because of his immaculate and wondrous grace. And this is something that, that, that is just powerful, that has been totally, that had been totally disregarded with. And, and I want you to just picture for a second living in a mentality where people are so fixated on um, not only saving yourself for marriage, because I, I, I'm not saying that we should dispose of uh, biblical sexuality. We're called to, uh, you know, the sexuality to be taking place in the marriage covenant. I'm not saying that we should be disposing of that. But what I'm saying is, is that that has been elevated to a level of of, uh, salvific, a salvific nature, right? This is something that is imperative to your salvation. But then people bring it further. They bring it to the areas of modesty as well. These are, you know, the first things that we think about when it, what it does it look like to live the Christian life? Well, for girls to wear modest clothing, this is the, this is what's propagated. I'm not saying that modesty isn't um, an aspect of what, you know, Christians should be thinking about. It absolutely should. But when it's always about the outward appearance and never about the heart level, you can understand why there would be this disconnect between what I do and and who I am on the inside. It's like, I'm just trying to appear to God as good. I'm just not going to do these things. But meanwhile, my heart is disconnected from him because I'm torn up in fear and shame. Uh, Another thing that, I mean, this might sound insane to you, but people freaking out over hugging. Uh, before marriage and being, you know, oh, is this something that is sexually impure? Uh, it, it's this kind of, uh, I don't know, hyper um, paranoia around men and women, honestly. And you see this. I mean, we, we make jokes about it. And a lot of this is, I think, good and right and not necessarily 
not necessarily wrong, but but like how girls and guys, especially in youth group, they are split up into their own groups. I think that's honestly healthy in a lot of ways. But if we're never promoting healthy male female relationships, even from an early age, when it's always like the opposite gender is dangerous, because I'm going to be honest with you, that's often what it's seen as like, don't get too close. They're dangerous. You got to be careful. Um, but you don't know the first thing about what it means to be healthy, uh, have a healthy relationship, relational dynamic with a person of the opposite gender. But there's just so much paranoia and, and fear around it. Um, I mean, I just think about uh, people have different uh, beliefs about this, right? People have different beliefs about kissing before marriage and all that. But I just think of the engagement video that I posted a while back of, um, and in that video, uh, you know, me and my fiance kissed and it's like, even just, you know, having to note that is going to be kind of put off some people like, why, why do you even need to note that? That's just kind of a normal thing. But for some people that is like, oh my goodness, that is a, that is a heinous sin, a heinous, heinous crime before a holy God. And I know uh, people have different perspectives and boundaries on this. And I think that's okay. And that's right. And that's good. And I support you in that. Um, but it's just that people have forced these extra biblical expectations and moralities on Christianity, the Christian culture in general, seen them as gospel, and in so doing have placed a, a, just an unreasonable burden on the shoulders of many people that would just like to follow Christ in freedom and, and a lightness and an easy yoke. But in turn, they have this weight on their shoulders that is fueled by shame. But I want to tell you right now, this shouldn't be the end of the story. I know for a lot of folks, um, they've they've experienced this. Maybe they grew up homeschooled in this kind of more fundamentalist environment, uh, and they've just been disconnected and disenfranchised from it. I know a lot of stories like that. But then there's also stories like mine, who you know grew up in a solid Christian household where my parents tried to push back on some of this stuff, and yet I was still impacted by the culture in general. But um, even still, I'm able to sort through some of the wreckage of these misconceptions and these extra biblical beliefs and some of this deep shame that's intertwined its way into my soul because I understand that the, f the freedom and forgiveness and redemption that is available in Christ, and it is on a daily basis receiving that, taking that in, and recognizing that God brings redemption. There's some scripture verses here that I just think are so impactful and important for this conversation. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me for I have redeemed you. But thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine God gives us a new main name. He has chosen us. We are his. He has redeemed us by his blood. Now, I recognize there are two ditches to every story. I can speak of the purity culture ditch where people were forcing extra biblical understandings and beliefs on the Christian culture in general that were leading to shame and guilt and um, disconnection from the true, living, merciful, loving God. Um, but also, there's another aspect where that I can't speak of as much to, where there's this uh, disregard of God's ways completely, that I can do whatever I want, that it is total embrace of sexual perversion and this perceived sexual liberation. That's not good either, right? So I'm not saying that this is the, that's the answer. I'm saying that what we need to find is sticking to what God has given us in his word, his commands, but recognizing that we can never measure up to that standard perfectly. We can never be perfectly pure, but in Christ, through his imputed righteousness on our behalf, we receive his righteousness. So we are seen as white as snow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Jesus, he's in the business of transformation, of heart transformation, so that when he looks at you, he no longer sees the sin that once uh, you know, took hold of your life. He no longer sees you as you know this crumpled piece of paper that cannot be fixed. No, he sees you as clean, as, as whole, as righteous, as, as pure, as lovely as beautiful as someone he delights in that's a beautiful thing and i pray that that gives you 
uh, that's a healing thing for you. I pray that that is the beginning of a new story for you in your life, one that is not built on shame or fear or guilt, but rather is now rejoicing in God, delighting in Him and seeking to glorify Him each and every day out of gratitude because He has freed you, because He has forgiven you. That is amazing. These videos are brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. If you want to support the work of my mission in equipping people to follow Jesus daily, click the link in my description. It would be a huge blessing. You would get access to all sorts of exclusive content, our Discord, um, exclusive video chats, and um, it would be wonderful to see you over there. Until next time, God bless.